Perfect. Okay, now I can start. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. So dangerous destruction or elephant in the room, the weight of population growth in three decades of increasing carbon emissions. This is the work I'm going to present and uh, has been recently published in the scientific journal Sustainability together with my colleagues, Philip Kefaro and Jean Giacomo Bravo. And the starting point of this work has been this sentence. Population growth is not a problem for climate change because population is mainly growing in poor countries whose contribution to global emissions is negligible. Uh, population growth is only a dangerous distraction from the real cause of emission increase, overconsumption in rich countries. Well, I don't know you, but I heard this sentence many, many times. But I had never seen a quantitative analysis supporting this claim. And that's why I decided to perform the analysis by myself. So I took the data from World Bank from 1992, which is the year of uh, um, the summit, uh, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro to 2019. Actually, I wanted it to 2022, so I would have had 30 years, but unfortunately, I couldn't find more recent data. There are some data, but uh, they are not complete. Anyway, I have almost three decades. And from the beginning of my analysis, I found a problem with this sentence because the underlying assumption of this sentence is that you can divide the world in poor and rich countries, which is a very common view, but it's obsolete. It does not reflect the reality today because today countries cannot be divided into two groups. They are a continuum and most of them are neither rich nor poor. They are in between. In fact, the common division, which is nowadays accepted and adopted within economy is a division in four groups. High income group, which are in blue in this map, upper middle income in green, blue, blue green, more or less. In this map, you recognize China, but also many Asian countries, uh, Latin American countries, and also several countries in Africa. Then lower middle income group in yellow in this map, and low income group in red in this map. And the, it's true that if you look at the low income group, their contribution to climate change, to global emissions is negligible only 0.6%. But this group is also the smallest one, eight, nine percent of the global population. For comparison, the high income group is almost double, almost 16%, while the largest majority of population is living in middle countries, in middle groups. And you cannot say for these groups, ah, uh, but population is negligible because uh, uh, their contribution to global change, to global emissions uh, are negligible because uh, it's their contribution are not negligible. Indeed, together, they contribute to more than 64% of global emissions. And in particular, the upper middle group contributes to 51%. So it's not only the largest, uh, contribution, but is uh, higher than all the other groups uh, together. And uh, these uh, middle groups uh, are also the groups uh, which increased most uh, their emissions uh, in the last uh, three decades, uh, both per capita and uh, total, and are still increasing. Here you see the changes, only the changes, not the absolute numbers uh, because uh, I put the initial value 100 uh, for all of them and I just uh, show the percentage in here because I wanted to highlight the changes. But anyway, you see that the middle groups uh, are the only one which increases a lot to their emissions. 
And what about population? Can we say, okay, but population is not important because uh, it is not increasing here, it's only increasing uh, in the low income group. Well, this is interesting. Uh, and okay, here you look just uh, at the uh, uh, variation, not the global emissions, but the variation between 1992 and 2019. And here you see that the middle groups are by far the largest contributors to the change, to the increase, especially upper middle group. 77% of the variation, so the increase in global emissions is from the upper middle group. And uh, yeah, what about population? It's interesting because uh, population actually increased in all the four groups, uh, including the high income group. Of course, uh, here there is a different scale, so don't be, uh, it can be a bit misleading. Actually, the growth rates uh, are very different depending on the groups. The high income group, uh, uh, here the growth has been 18. Uh, 0.5% in three decades, which is actually a very relevant growth, but is it looks pretty small compared to the low income group, 110%. So here, population are almost double. So the growth rate are very different, but you remember the low income group is the smallest one. So here, if you look at the rates, but if you look at the absolute numbers, it's pretty interesting because you see that the low income group here, the growth has been 357 million. But in the upper middle group, the growth has been 622 million. So even if the growth rate was much smaller, the growth in numbers and absolute numbers has been larger. And in the lower middle group, has been more than 1 billion. So it's not true that uh, population is growing only in the low income group. Actually, if you look at the absolute numbers, uh, it's growing much more in the middle groups. So of course, also the drivers of the growth are different because uh, in some cases, uh, the main driver is uh, um, in immigration, for example, in the high income group. In other cases, is the uh, uh, demographic momentum, for example, uh, uh, in India. In other cases, uh, is the high fertility or a combination of all these drivers. But if you think uh, that fertility is high only in the low income group, uh, you are wrong again. Now I'm going to tell you where fertility is high. And when I say high, I mean uh, above uh, the replacement rate. So fertility is high. Let's start with the low income group in all the countries with only one exception. So can you guess which one is this exception? Can you guess? It's North Korea. North Korea is the only poor country with low fertility. All the others have high fertility. Uh, in the lower middle group, Fertility is high in the largest majority of countries, in about half of the countries in the upper middle group, and also in five countries in the high income group, which are Saudi Arabia, Oman, Kuwait, Israel, and Panama. Uh, so it's not true that fertility is high only in the low income group. And anyway, regardless of the causes, population is growing more or less everywhere. There are some countries where population is stable or even slightly declining like Japan, for example, but overall is growing. And this growth affects carbon emissions. And now I'm going to tell how. I'm going a little bit technical, but simple. So follow me. Uh, so, total emissions uh, are the product uh, of per capita emissions uh, and population. Exactly like the area of a rectangle is the product uh, of the two dimensions. But in this case, uh, you cannot compare directly the two dimensions because, of course, they have uh, different units. 
But when it comes to the variation of the product, then you can compare the contribution of the dimensions. For example, let's imagine that the area of a rectangle increases during a certain period of time, but only one dimension increases. For example, the height. The other dimension stays constant. Then you can say, okay, the height contributed to 100% of the total change. And if the other dimension changed in the opposite direction, in that case, you can say that the height contributed to more than 100% because contributed to the increase and also to the missed decrease that could have occurred thanks to the reduction of the other dimension. And this is just the basic idea, but uh, uh, here you see inside the mathematical formula that I applied to compute the contribution of each dimension. I don't go into details, okay. but you see that the total change can be split into the sum of three terms. One is the contribution of population, one is the contribution of per capita emissions change, and the third one is uh, the contribution of the interaction of both changes. Uh, as for uh, the interpretation, uh, this first term, the contribution of population, yeah, you can see it as uh, it represents well. the. Sorry. Okay. It represents uh, the uh, change uh, in total emissions uh, that would have occurred if only population had changed. Likewise, uh, this, is, uh, this represents the, the change in total emissions that would have uh, occurred if uh, only per capita emissions uh, had changed and the population had stayed constant. And now I'm going to apply this formula to our groups. So let me show what happened in these groups from 1992 to 2019. So in this period, in all the groups, the total emissions increased. The new rectangle, which is this transparent docted rectangle, is larger than the green rectangle. And the rectangles represent the total emissions. And this in all the groups. In all the groups, the population increased. Population is here in the y-axis. But the per capita emissions decreased in two groups because it decreased both in the low income group and also in the high income group, which is pretty surprising, surprising because usually the media don't tell this. The media says, oh, in rich countries, population does not grow that much, but they don't say that per capita emissions don't grow at all. Indeed, rich countries in the last 30 years reduced on average their per capita emissions. Not enough, not all the countries, but on average, they reduced you see, their per capita emissions. In spite of this, they failed to reduce the total emissions, which increased over 425 million tons. This is not much compared with the middle groups, but still, this is an increase. Instead, we could have achieved a reduction thanks to the reduction in per capita emissions. So in this group, population growth is responsible for more than 100%, actually almost 500% of the total change. And what about the other groups? In all the other groups, population growth is a significant driver, but in the upper middle group, the main driver is the increase in per capita emission change. And since this group is the most important, is the highest contributors 
to global emissions, when we add all the contributions, we found that the most important is per capita emission change, almost 45% of the total increase. But population is anyway important, more than 40%. So it's almost equally important. And it's especially important in the high income group, which is surprising because it's almost the opposite of the common narrative. But here in this group, population growth nullified the effect of the reduction in per capita emissions. So I ask again, is population growth a dangerous distraction or is the elephant in the room? And just I wanted to say that uh, also the last, uh, the, the last um, uh, IPCC report uh, confirmed that that is an important driver. Thank you for your attention. John Watkins. Woo. I liked it very much. Yeah, uh, I, I stop working. now. I think I stopped uh, the. Uh, uh, I think I stopped uh, the record. Um, I don't see again. Ah, uh, pause.